Um, let me get right to the chase. <coughs> Cory Booker is a very poor representative of the life and lifestyle and needs and attitudes and ambitions of the people of the state of New Jersey. And I think that every minute he spends as a United States Senator is a waste of our money and our time as a nation and our time as a state. And I think I can find in the state of New Jersey a lot of support from people that just believe that. Unfortunately, that's not going to be enough to win an election. We just watched somebody try and take on Cory Booker, and it was 100% negative. Basically, they, they, they pounded his record, they pounded his lack of accomplishments, they pounded his background, and Steve Lonigan did a sensational job of increasing Cory Booker's negatives. What he didn't do was make a good case for why he should be a United States Senator. And I guess that's my challenge, is to come up in front of people like you and say, I think I'd make a good senator. So let me back up a little bit and just give you a little bit of a biography about myself. <coughs> I was born in the Bronx. My parents moved to New Jersey in 1964. I grew up in New Milford, New Jersey. I was the first, uh, I was the first class to go through the New Milford Middle School. Big school they built in that town. We'd never seen anything like it. They changed the education program where we used to have elementary school till eighth grade, and now there was a middle school. And then after that, I was <coughs> privileged to go to New York Military Academy where I learned a, a tremendous amount of things and grew up pretty quickly. Won a full scholarship to Cornell University. And then after I graduated Cornell, where I studied uh, hotel administration, computers, and business, I went in the Army, served 20 years in the United States Army Reserve. I attained the rank of major. Now I live in Freehold. Uh, we've been here 20, 20 years? Yeah, we've been here 20 years. Um, my wife Pam is a, is a lifelong resident of Freehold. And and we built a business in this town, in this county, in this state, where we help businesses use technology to solve problems. I started my first company fixing stuff for people when I was eight years old. When I was in college, I worked different jobs uh, as a projectionist, as a radio producer, I ran a TV studio. I've done a lot of things where I was serving the public. I've worked in restaurants, I've been a bartender, I've changed tires, I've been a limousine driver. The number of things that I could do, I'm as comfortable with the sequel as I am with a long arm squeegee. There's a lot of things that I've been able to do. And what I do in my business is I work with lawyers, accountants, doctors, hairdressers, retail shops, you name the type of business. I work with the owners and the employees trying to solve business problems. Lately, the problems that I'm trying to solve all involve overregulation. They involve the government getting involved in all different types of areas. And that's why I've come to the conclusion that nobody in the Senate really understands the damage that's being done by poorly written, poorly conceived, poorly implemented legislation. When you hear Nancy Pelosi say we have to pat read it so we can find out what's in it, <coughs> In, in any other profession, that would be called malpractice. You can't it, put something on people unless you know what it is. It's fundamentally wrong. And, and I see that firsthand in every type of business you can imagine in every corner of this state. And because I see that, and I can, I can bear witness to it in so many different perspectives, I don't necessarily need a lobbyist to help me form my opinion when I'm talking with, with my friends, the senators. I can actually tell them that the regulations they're putting on doctors prevent them from spending more than 120 seconds away from their computer terminal, or else they're punished by having it lock up. It's true, by the way. Your doctors are going nuts about this, because if they're away from their computer terminal for too long, it locks them out. So they're training themselves to spend less time with you and more time on the computer. This is the federal government inside the exam room with you and your doctor. They've arrived. They're also telling us, telling our teachers, each and every year, they're telling our teachers over and over again what they have to teach, how they have to teach, how well they have to teach, where they have to teach, what they can say what they teach, what they can't say when they teach. 
I can't understand for the life of me why the teachers consistently support a government that continues to put a yoke around their neck and deny them to write the right to do the job they've trained and spent their entire lives wishing they could do. I don't understand it. And my job this year is to go out and talk to as many teachers as I can and explain to them that their right to practice their profession in the way they know is best is being removed from them by the federal government. There are so many issues where the federal government is, is, is reaching their hand into our lives. At the time of the Civil War, the only time you would have bumped into the federal government would have been if you had to put a, go to the post office put a stamp on a letter. And now they're in your bathroom controlling the size of your toilet. They're in your house in every room telling you what light bulbs you can have. They're in your children's classrooms telling them what they can learn, how they can learn. They're in your doctor's office. They're in your grocery store. They're in your farm stand. They're at the fish market. The federal government is everywhere. And I have had the opportunity to actually work in all those businesses and see the damage that they do. Nobody believes that business is better in New Jersey because of the federal regulations put down by the EPA. Nobody believes <laughs> that teachers are freer to teach and can teach better with more regulations from the Federal Department of Education. Nobody looking for financing believes that Dodd-Frank is actually helping avoid financial breakdowns. Nobody believes anything is coming out of Washington, D.C., so I think it's time that we actually sent somebody up to Washington that can go eyeball to eyeball with other senators and explain to them, not like a lobbyist, but actually as a peer, and explain to them what they don't have the ability to see. And I really need for New Jersey to help make that happen because we have an opportunity to send somebody to the Senate that can do that. But I'm so glad that Lillian started talking about party unity because that's the only way we're really going to be able to do it is if we come together as a party and get behind a candidate that can make a case in every corner of this state for why they should be sent to Washington, D.C. A candidate that can go to any person of any party, of any persuasion, and say, there are things about me you agree with, there are things about me you don't agree with, but together we agree on more than what we disagree on. And by saying that and making that case, that's how we'll actually come together and First of all, make the party a lot stronger, because here's the story. I'm not Chris Christie. I don't have his stature. I don't have his background. I don't have his personality. I'm not Chris Christie. What the party needs to get behind is not a person, and they did a great job doing that last year. My hat's off to the governor. He did a sensational job. What the party has to get behind is an idea. The idea is, New, it's about time New Jersey got some respect. We make it, they take it. Everything we make, Washington, D.C. takes from us and hands out to the rest of the country, the rest of the world. We are the feeding trough of every feel-good politician that wants to solve the problems of America. And that has to stop. And I think I can get most Republicans to say, yeah, that's right. I think I can get most people in the state to look around and say, yeah, that's right, because every time they say, well, we should spend more money on fill in the blanks, what they're saying is, we gotta go hit up New Jersey for more money. And I think that really has to stop. They take our resources and they spread it around and that has to stop. We're not gonna do that if we let them control the agenda. I mean, we're watching, we're watching the media frothing at the mouth over a traffic jam in Fort Lee. Day after day, week after week, we're being bombarded with this story, and yet we, we, haven't, we have to bring these people to justice, right? We hear it all the time. There has to be justice. We need investigators. Justice must be done. How about justice for those killed in Benghazi? How about for justice? for those border agents 
gunned down with automatic weapons, walked into Mexico by our own Justice Department. Where's, where's that justice? I could go on and on talking about the way we are being misled away from the real problems and told to look here and don't look over there. So, what I, what I propose to do is just get us together. Now, this is what they want to do. They want to chop us down, slice us, dice us into all these different little groups. Some of us are pro-life. Some of us are pro-choice. Some of us support the death penalty. Some of us don't. Some of us support the Second Amendment. Some of us would like to see even greater restrictions on weapons. Some of us think marriage equality makes sense and this time has come. Some of us don't want to see that going on. You take those four issues, a pro and a con on each of those, and I look around the room, everybody has their own opinion on each of those. If they drag us into a debate on those issues, we don't have a chance of winning. And once again I say, let's get together on the ideals that we can all believe in. So I can walk into any room and I can say, I believe that everyone has the right to live in peace as they choose, with whom they choose, as long as they don't harm anybody else. They should be assured that nobody, no politician, no government, nobody will deny them of their basic rights. I think we can all agree on that. And that's the message that I have to bring around the state. And then, as soon as I, everybody understands where I stand on those, all those issues, you know, four by two and pros and cons, can we get back to the important stuff, which is we are losing our country and we're losing our children's future. And they've figured out how to do it. They paid attention when Lincoln gave his speech. Lincoln said, a house divided upon itself cannot stand. But then, what did he go on to say? He went on to say that he did not think, and I don't think, that the house will fall. It won't fall, but it will become all one way or all the other way. There are people that think that we have to increase dependence on government. There are people that think that the government needs to spend more money, give more stuff out to people. And then there are those of us that think the way to make this country successful is to give people opportunity, stop putting a yoke on them, unleash the potential and the capabilities of the individuals, unleash the potentials and the capabilities of the states to solve their problems, the sovereigns that came together because the federal government was created by the states to serve the states. That's been turned upside down. And that's just a function of the last 40 years. It started in the 70s when the federal government started withholding federal money if state governments didn't pass laws that the feds wanted. Fortunately, just now with Obamacare, when they tried that with Medicare, the Supreme Court finally said, uh-uh, uh-uh. If the federal government says you're supposed to get money, you can't go and put strings on it later. So there's, there's a glimmer of hope. But that's what's going on. We should have a federal government that serves the states. The state should not serve them. And that's the message I want to bring. And that's, that's what I think if we unify the party, we can speak with a, with a common voice and a powerful voice at that. So if you think that everybody has a right to an opinion, then listen to what I have to say about that. If you think that everybody has a right to live in peace with their neighbors, then come on out and vote for me. If you think that a house divided among itself cannot stand, then stand with me. Unite our house. Because with a united party, we can send a united voice to Washington. And we can actually make New Jersey heard and speak some sense and truth to the people in these powerful positions that don't understand the power that they have. And it's important that we do that and we get started on it right away. Because I believe that we didn't inherit this country from our parents. 
we're borrowing it from our children. And, and we owe it to them to set a good example and give it back to them better than we found it. With your help, with the help of the Republicans, with the help of the people of the state of New Jersey, I think we can actually make something happen this year. Thank you very much.